Welcome back to another Metro Lounge video. Continuing on the topic of naval history, today we will look at how propulsion systems have evolved throughout the centuries and decades. For most of human history, ships were either pulled across by many men with oars, or they were at the mercy of the wind. As ships became larger and larger, and the navies of Europe transformed from coastal defence forces that focused on boarding actions, to floating gun batteries that reached the far side of the world, the sail plans evolved to accommodate this. In my previous video, I discussed the evolution of these sail ships step by step, but for the purposes of this video, we will keep it brief. Tudor period English naval royale ships of the larger Carrick variety may have had three or four masts with a mainsail and a topsail, and lateen sails. Ships in the 18th and 19th century Royal Navy had topgallant sails, staysails, jibs, and a spanker in place of the lateen sail. Apart from these small variations, the basic concept remained the same. The sails would create lift and pull the ship with them. A new form of propulsion, harnessing the energy of superheated steam. No longer were ships at the mercy of the elements or the strength of men. The SS Savannah, technically the first steamship to make its way across the Atlantic, although it did this mostly under sail power, with a 90 horsepower steam engine and paddle wheels on either side for propulsion. The first truly steam powered crossing happened in 1833 with the SS Royal William, a 276 horsepower steamship with a top speed of just under 12 knots. This was not fast, but unlike a pure sail ship, it was consistent and on demand power. It consumed about 17 tons of coal per day to achieve this crossing. The most common type of steam engine at this period was the side lever. This classification refers to the connection mechanism as opposed to the actual drive method of the engine. This engine is an evolution of the beam engine, and it was only suitable for paddle steamers. Direct acting engines replaced these propulsion methods, with pistons being connected to the crankshaft either directly or via connecting rods. These were far more efficient, lighter engines that required less space. These paddle steamers were eventually replaced by the more efficient propeller form of propulsion, with the SS Archimedes having a single propeller fitted and driven by twin cylinder vertical steam engines. Eventually, compound steam engines allowed for even more powerful steamships, with the steam being used by multiple pistons before returning to the boilers. A double expansion steam engine could have one set of cylinders operating at a higher pressure and another set at a lower pressure. Triple expansion and quadruple expansion engines followed after higher steam pressures were permitted, with each set of pistons being optimised to lower and lower steam pressures. These ships had come a long way from the early days of steam power, and ships no longer required sail power as a backup by the 20th century. Ocean liners like the Olympic and Titanic experimented with steam turbine technology, using the lower pressure steam to drive a low pressure steam turbine and squeeze out extra power for a third propeller. Warships rapidly adopted these steam turbines as their primary form of propulsion, preferred for their higher power output and efficiency. The first major example of this was HMS Dreadnought. HMS Dreadnought was powered by two sets of Parsons steam turbines, with each set driving two propeller shafts. HMS Dreadnought had 18 boilers and four three-bladed propellers. It could produce 27,000 shaft horsepower to propel it to 21 knots. HMS Dreadnought revolutionised the propulsion of warships from here on out. The smoother, more powerful and efficient steam turbines made reciprocating steam engines entirely redundant, at least for warships. The speed and versatility they offered 
completely unlike anything else ever seen before. After Dreadnought, there isn't much of a change in the preferred propulsion of a warship for most of the 20th century. Ships changed from being coal fired to being oil fired instead with the HMS Queen Elizabeth. Oil was easier to refuel and produced less visible black smoke. Outside of small improvements, however, steam power still reigned supreme, being the preferred method of propulsion into the 1960s and 70s. Before we get to the current day, let's talk about why a warship and a passenger or merchant ship have such vastly different propulsion systems. Nowadays, large container ships will typically have a massive diesel engine directly driving the propeller shaft. Some natural gas carrying ships may still use steam turbines, cannibalizing their own cargo as the fuel source, but these are a rare exception. Most cruise ships and ferries use diesel generators, which drive the shafts via electric motors. Let's get to the bottom of why this is. First and foremost, a large cargo ship will have the space required to fit a two or three story diesel engine due to their vast size. Their purpose is to travel from point A to point B at a consistent pace while maximizing fuel economy and efficiency. Reliability is also a large factor. They need a propulsion system that avoids complications, is consistent and is relatively cheap and simple enough to maintain by a small crew. Cargo ships typically travel at one constant speed throughout their voyage, balancing fuel economy and the time taken to reach the destination. The downside of these large diesel engines is a lack of flexibility and maneuverability which means that they will almost always require tugs to get into and out of ports. A cruise ship, or a ferry, however, will typically opt for diesel generators, which don't require a direct connection with the propeller shaft. This allows cruise ships to fix their propellers to pods that can rotate 360 degrees. These are called azimuth thrusters. This means that they can get in and out of ports without tugboat assistance and makes them extremely flexible for their size. But both of these examples are still quite different from the propulsion systems of a warship. Civilian ships prioritize reliability and low cost. But what happens when you require maximum flexibility and fuel efficiency doesn't really matter anymore? Let's look at some modern examples of warship propulsion systems. We will start with a Type 42 destroyer. The Type 42 was a destroyer class of the Royal Navy between 1975 and 2013. The propulsion used by Type 42s is called COGOG. This stands for a combination of gas or gas. What this means in practice is two sets of gas turbines effectively jet engines that drove a power turbine connected to a gearbox, which then drove the propeller shafts. The Type 42 had two Rolls-Royce Olympus turbines, the very same ones that were fitted to Concorde, and it also had a second set of smaller Rolls-Royce Tyne gas turbines. It could use one or the other, hence the gas or gas. This allowed them to be fast, really fast. They could travel at speeds in excess of 30 knots, with 50,000 shaft horsepower per Olympus engine. This method of propulsion perfectly suits the specific role of these ships, allowing them to be rapid and flexible at the cost of being noisy and incredibly inefficient for fuel. I should mention why the gas turbines superseded the steam turbines before I continue. The steam turbine, whilst more efficient than a gas turbine, was also heavy and required things like boilers and condensers, which took up a lot of space. The gas turbine was simply a far superior option for warships due to their relative simplicity and their power to weight ratio. Other destroyers, like the US Navy's Arleigh Burke class ships, use a similar setup, with Arleigh Burke's using a COGAG configuration standing for combination of gas and gas. 
This means that it can use multiple gas turbines for one shaft. But not all modern large warships use this propulsion method. So why might different warships use different forms of propulsion, if Kogog and Kogag are so good? To answer this, we will have to look at the Type 23 frigate of the Royal Navy. The Type 23 was originally built with one main goal, hunting submarines. This means that keeping quiet is a necessity, but as we know, a warship also has to be adaptable. It should be able to sacrifice economy and sensibility for sporadic bursts of high speed and maneuverability. This is why the Type 23 uses cod lag drive, standing for a combination of diesel, electric and gas. This allows the Type 23 to cruise around using diesel generators only, the shafts being driven by electric motors. This not only allows the Type 23 to be quiet when hunting submarines, as two of the diesel generators are in soundproofed enclosures and two are above the waterline, but it also allows it to be fuel efficient when cruising at a leisurely 15 knots. But when it needs to sprint, it can clutch in two Rolls-Royce Spey gas turbines through a gearbox and achieve speeds of 30 knots. It does not necessarily need both gas turbines driving both shafts when sprinting, as one shaft can be driven by a gas turbine and the other by electric motors. An alternative propulsion system to this would be cod log, in which either diesel electric drive or a gas turbine can be used, as opposed to both at the same time. So then, surely this covers all the modern propulsion methods of a warship? Not quite. There is a relatively new propulsion method, although it is a fairly controversial one. This propulsion method is called IEP, or Integrated Electric Propulsion. The examples we're going to use for Integrated Electric Propulsion will be the Type 45 destroyer of the Royal Navy, as well as the Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Integrated Electric Propulsion uses diesel generators and gas turbines, just like Cod Lag or Cod Log. The difference? There is no connection between any of the engines and the shafts. Instead, both the diesel generators and the gas turbines generate AC current, which is then fed through frequency converters into electric motors to drive the shafts at any speed and in any direction. This allows for the most amount of flexibility with the least amount of mechanical complications, removing the need for gearboxes entirely. This system has not been implemented well in modern destroyers, however, with cooling issues being prevalent as well as underpowered diesel generators having to be supplemented by gas turbines constantly. I should also mention that IEP is also used by the ocean liner Queen Mary II. This is because, unlike a cruise ship, ocean liners are also designed for speed. I did not include nuclear warships in this video because at the end of the day, they are just steam turbine driven ships with a different method of boiling the water. So that covers it all, from the galleons of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, to the third rates of Trafalgar, from pre-dreadnoughts to the battlecruisers of the Second World War, to the guided missile destroyers of the modern day.